why don't, uh, in case there are new people, why don't you introduce yourself? I'll introduce okay. myself quick. <laughs> we can tell them what we did last All right. session. So, last session we did some silhouette work, and uh, I guess I'll introduce myself first to get that out of the way. My name is Louise Adler, and I am a concept artist, graphic designer, texture artist, and so on and so forth for Tripwire Interactive. I do almost anything 2D you can think of. Um, I wear many hats at my line of work, but primarily, pre predominantly I work in 2D. And so we'll be going through some concepting today. I'll be walking you through how I normally work out rough concepts to finish concepts. And in this half, we'll be doing coloring more than anything. I'll quickly go over the stuff that we went over the last hour, and uh, I'll hand it over to Tom. Right. My <laughs> name is Tom Biondolillo. I'm a freelance contractor. I've done comic books and toy design and illustration and animation. Uh, and I also have, have written before and write uh, increasingly so. Um, I also teach at the Art Institute of Atlanta in the Media Arts and Animation Department and some, pr uh, some classes in the Game Art and Design. Cute! So here we are! <laughs> I'm more energetic now because now I'm not so dead after waking up. <laughs> so, la so last session we did uh, a lot on concept and we can still go back and forth into that. That's not a dead topic but yep. uh, Luis uh, led us through uh, how she sets up a job and gave us a lot of hints and took some good questions from the crowd. And now, uh, more of the same, except maybe also we're moving more towards the finished production level yes. digital painting. What you do for uh, a model? Pretty for much. A, a for a video game? Pretty much. So last time uh, we went over silhouette work, I was basically em emphasizing that you have to have good silhouette work in order to do fa fast pa pipeline and work. Uh, these are some of the examples that we went through, and after that we chose one of them and then we gave it basic shading. He's a very happy fellow. Yay! So, basic shading is in black and white, normally is how I work, because I can quickly see the values, I can quickly see if the shape is going to turn out right, I can see if the proportions are off or if they're right. Cur currently this is super, super rough, like, like you saw. Uh, I stressed also that it's really important that you flip the canvas. You keep seeing things that are going to trick your eye because every time you flip the canvas, you look at a whole new image. Your brain thinks that you just swapped image and looking at something brand new. Flip the canvas. If you're having a traditional painting, pick up the painting, hold it up against the light, and flip it around. Same effect. You'll start seeing errors and correct them. Do yourself a favor. Um, so that's how far we got last time, and now we're going to go over to some coloring. Yay, coloring! So, um, with this particular piece, we basically took this silhouette down here, this guy, and I worked on this a little bit before. So, this particular piece, if you remove the colors, uh, which I can't do, wow, okay, never mind. My Photoshop file decided to not work with me. So let's do this instead. Hue saturation. This is the black and white version. So imagine that this is the rougher state of this one. So there's no soft shading yet. Everything has been blocked out and you start getting an idea for the shape and form. There are no colors yet. Now what this does is that it helps you look at the image and go like, okay, so these values are starting to look really good or really bad. It really depends on what you're going for. If you're going for a dark look or a light look and shape and form, block it out in black and white. You can quickly see these values. They will help you. After that is done, I have, let's merge these down and we'll do this from scratch. Um, and I will show you, well, there we go. So now this is black and white and now we need to color it. Now, in, oh, go away. <laughs> so, <laughs> the way I color is a little bit different from how other people may do it. And there's no right or wrong. Now, with coloring in terms of making something quick and dirty, um, I like to have everything on separate layers. That way it's easy to manipulate. I can easily change it. And for a base color, double click in Photoshop and you get a bunch of options on your layers. Now, something called color overlay is going to be one of your best friends. The reason for that is that you can pick a color, give it a nice hue value that you want this dude to have. Um, after that you go to overlay. Overlay is a wonderful thing. It will give you a nice range of values right off the bat in one set color. Now, if you have split your, your image up in multiple pieces, so let's say that I don't want this particular part to have the same colors. Let's see if I can work on this teeny tiny surface. And get the lasso tool. Yay! 
So let's say we really don't want the skirt to have that hue color. And this is just for blocking out, but this makes the process really, really quickly and you can easily change anything that you're currently working on. What did you do? You silly thing. All right, let's try this again. Stop deselecting. Thank you. So you're going to select this out and make a duplicate layer with that information? Pretty much. Okay. So what happens is that since we don't want the skirt to have that color, control X, control Y, move that up again. There are easier ways to do this, but this is just for quick and dirty purposes. Mm -hmm. Now, if the skirt needs to be a different color, guess what? You can do the same thing. You just change the color up. The, beauti thing, the beautiful thing with having layers like this is that you can change everything on the go. You don't necessarily have to worry about, well, we want the character to have this color instead. Well, you just painted it with all that color in one layer and now mm -hmm. it's flat. And you can't change it easily in the, except through your huge saturation level changer, which is this little guy. Mm -hmm. Now, this one allows you to do a bunch of changes, but to a flat surface it might not help you. By keeping it under these properties, however, you can easily go in and change that. Another way you can do it, if you don't want to do it this way, is hue saturation. Let's do this again and pretend that everything is black and white. Oh, I hate this menu. All right. As you can tell, I'm not used to working on teeny tiny surfaces. And this mm -hmm. is a Surface Pro and it's a little limiting. If you guys have any questions, please just raise your hand or ask them along the way. Yes, Perfect interrupt time. me. You don't have to wait I don't for mind. a question session. Yes, sir. I have gotten increasingly spoiled over the years, so I use a Cintiq. <laughs> nice big one? Yes. The, cur the one that I'm currently hiding here in my lap is a Intuos Pro. This is a Wacom product. Wacom products are really, really, really good. It's pretty much industry, pretty much industry standard. If you can't afford an Intuos, which is like a couple hundred, I think, if, <coughs> if less, uh, go for the Bamboo brand. If you're new to digital painting and want to get into that, Bamboo is a really, really good brand under the Wacom family. Um, then you can go to Graphire. I think they might even have done away with that. And then you have the Intuos, and then you have the Creme de la Creme, which is the Cintiqs. For those who don't know what a Cintiq is, is the actual process of drawing right onto mm -hmm. your screen. And these screens are big, heavy, expensive, and beautiful. I love these screens. Their touch sensitivity. Uh, the newest screens also allow you to do, just like in the Surface Pro, and moving things around with your fingertips mm -hmm. as well, which is really cool. Mine is just a regular 22 HD, which doesn't have the touch function. A little bit cheaper, but nice. Um, so if you were going for a portable uh, option, like something that you could have on the go with a Surface Pro? Surface Pro, I've found, is beautiful. I like it for sketch work, for quick work, for highly detailed long-term work. I don't feel comfortable with it. That's why everything is turning out very sketchy, because it's a small surface. I mm -hmm. feel cramped. I don't feel like I can completely relax with it. But for portability and for money-wise, this baby is good. <laughs> so consider that. Sorry. All sorts of touch screens, other brands are going to be coming on the market that blow away what we used to think were fantastic sensitivity yes. wise before. I mean, they're, they're probably at pro level for a few years ago, and they're going to be up to Cintiq level. Cintiq will probably have to be better to continue to keep its market, but it's well going to be within the range of anything you do. Well, for the most part, just uh, it depends yeah. product by product, but you're going to be able to find. Touch screens are everywhere, and they're eventually all going to be sensitive enough to paint on them, draw on them, etc. Fortunately, the Surface Pro is actually using Wacom technology, which means that the sensitivity of when you're drawing on it is going to be almost as good as the actual Wacom products. Mm -hmm. So don't let that shy you away. This is really good stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the new iPads are using in terms of technology. I don't think it's the Wacom, uh, but I hear that they are supposed to be really good. Mm -hmm. So if you have the money and you want to spend it on the Apple family, go right ahead. I don't really trust them like Apple myself. Yeah. I think it's more of a fashion <coughs> brand. <laughs> but that's just personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Here's what I did. All right. Uh, if you hold down your awesome shift button, control button, sorry, you select everything on a particular layer. If you've been smart and you've been working in layers, everything has been separate. So control select that baby, make a new layer, mask that. There's this button down here. This little guy down here it will allow you to create a mask. Now, 
if you keep things separately and on a mask, you can allow yourself to color it, which is really nice. So set the layer of properties to overlay and go to town. Now, once again, this is a really nice quick way to get colors blocked in and you can still change it without changing the underlying black and white values. This is why I really like working with this method is because it allows me to adjust the values beneath on its own black and white layer and it allows me to adjust the colors all separately. I don't have anything merged I'd, until much later which allows me to easily manipulate the image and work effectively when my art director suddenly throws a 180 and goes like, well, you know, we should probably change the, this and this. And I'll be like, ah, but due to all the separations of layers, uh, keeping everything neat and organized, that is an easy, easy change. Mm -hmm. Work smart. Work with all the stuff that Photoshop actually gives you because you'll thank you for, thank you mm -hmm. for it. It really, you really, really will. If you paint it with the native color, the, the local color, that's what it is. It's red, it's green, it's tan, it's whatever. You'd have to change that. You can still change it, but uh, working the way sh she suggests with just the value first, then it's just a matter of glazing by any other name and just shifting the U. Yes. Okay. There are other ways, too. You can use the um, same method, working it up in black and white to make sure it's a solid, hard object. And it's in the round. It has the or the graphic feel you're looking for, but uh, you can then go in and you can use channels, um, you can use levels, you can do any number of different things. Photoshop and these programs are so organic, it's just a matter of what way do you like doing it now. You yep. can get to the same or slightly different uh, results used doing many different ways. And by keeping things this separately and organized, I, I can't stress it enough, you will thank yourself later on because you you might find yourself going, well, I didn't like this at all. What do I do now? And then everything is separated. And you can go, okay, cool. Delete, Change it. copy, duplicate, go. And I know there's a lot of artists that swear by keeping everything flat and working on a flat layer is more organic and it's more classic painting and whatnot. But let's face it, you're in Photoshop. Don't work flat unless you absolutely have to and you absolutely love to. Because later down the road, if you want to manipulate a particular part of the image, you're restricted. You're really restricted. Learn to work in layers. Learn to organize your layers and utilize Photoshop mm -hmm. as much as you can. It, you really will, it really will help you. Yeah. It can get crazy, though. I mean, when you start getting up to 50, 60, 150 layers, then <laughs> you're probably taking it a little to the, the extreme. Start um, merging. Yeah, you merge. As, as soon as you made your general decisions, merge down those results into one unified layer. So you have just a few. Yep. I'll still have like 15, 30 layers, but... Yep. Um, Towards the end, when you're adding some filters or doing some sort of effects, at that point, you probably need to merge your, your final layers to get that, uh, that filter effect or that, um, but until then, keep them open. Yes. And always keep a separate file in case you mess it all up and you can go back to the original one that was all merged. I'm just a bad person. I forget to save and stuff. So um, make it a habit to hit that control S, sincerely. Mm -hmm. Make it a habit. Yeah. I've done so many live streams where I've been sitting for three hours straight. I have a picture and I'm like, okay, this is actually getting finished. Oh, I haven't saved yet. <laughs> like I've lost things from getting mm -hmm. so immersed in what I'm doing, especially when live streaming that after three hours, you're like, I should have saved about two hours ago and I never did. Mm -hmm. And then you lose your work. Make it a habit. When you're happy with a sketch, save it. Then gradually, as you progress, control save, control save, control save. <laughs> You'll thank yourself for it later. Don't become like me. It's bad habits. So, anyways, if you have any questions, just hit me up, and uh, Tom will any happily questions? help as well. You use okay. Different what? Different brushes. Different brushes to color. Now, in this case, I am playing around with a very rough brush. Uh, normally, I use, this is a texture brush, it's a watercolor digital uh, brush. You can find a bunch of these online for free. Uh, DeviantArt have tons of these galleries that you can just download. Make sure they are commercial free and make sure that you have permission to use them. 
uh, double check all these things. You do not want to end up in a rabbit hole where all of a sudden you submit a picture and people are like, dude, that's my brush set. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't let you have that. <laughs> so don't end up in a situation like that. Double check, everything is free. Anyways, um, I use the texture brush for a lot of rough work when I'm working. Uh, for otherwise, just go with the regular uh, Photoshop brushes, which is like the soft mm -hmm. pressure, soft round, hard round. They do wonders as well. Yeah. They, it, there's just a personal preference, um, if that makes any sense. I don't know what I'm saying. Okay. As far as the color too, sometimes you need some backlighting, you need some uh, the color constancy, some environmental light uh, moving in on the character to pop it out or to play with warm colors coming forward and cool colors in the shadows. At that point, you might want to either separate out a, ah. the shadows into another layer and add some cool to pop the warm flesh tones out or et, et cetera. Um, so. You don't always just want just one color overlay, but you can paint into it later on yes. afterwards and add those that last little bit of blue or, or warm color under the chin to really you know, project those volumes. Um, but that can come later on. To begin with, the uh, flexibility of just being able to overlay or glaze over a color, um, regardless of the term you use, um, is really beneficial to begin with. It's in, really in setting fast. the tones. It's just fast and efficient, and you don't necessarily have to think too much about what you're doing. You're just blocking things out, and when you're happy with the base colors, like Tom said, I tend to merge things and start working in all the details. Mm -hmm. So what I did now is that I created an additional new layer so that if you want to have any kind of backlighting going on, just mask out silhouette once more so you don't have to do a bunch of cleanup work. Uh, start sending, like drawing out, you know, the backlight and lighting on that character and, you know, you're already having a head start. And put some complementary colors in there. Yes. Okay. And actually, this is traditional painting. If you've ever taken a, uh, an acrylics class or a very classical one or a uh, oil painting, you're going to go in there and you're going to use a sienna or some sort of just simple single tone and you're going to paint that out in black and white. Um, or and values in gray, and then you'll glaze over it. And either you might move towards impasto or, or uh, ah. very opaque colors, or keep them transparent. But either way, these are just painting techniques. It's not necessarily endemic just to uh, digital painting. Mm. And the reason I'm doing a white color is, once again, I'm really, really adamant about using as many options as I can. So after that has been shaded in, I use a color that is very stark so I can tell, tell where those drawing colors are. After that, you can basically go into color overlay. God, I hate you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and just change it to whatever your back, there you go. You know, what your back color is going to be. So mm -hmm. like I said, make it versatile in terms of like uh, being able to uh, adjust to what you need. Don't don't unnecessarily hold yourself into an, an area where you're going to be restricted and go like, well, I painted that red and now I can't change it effectively. You know, mm -hmm. keep yourself open to these things. Questions? No. None. Okay. Limitations, uh, basically it just depends, she's asking if there are any limitations by working the way I'm doing right now. Um, it really depends. Uh, if I find that I'm at a point now where I'm like, uh, well, I've been separating all these things for so long and now I need to merge everything in order to progress with, oh, I don't know, the background or whatever it may be. What I tend to do at that stage, let's say that this is fine, but this is really rough and now I need to smooth everything out, but now everything is separate. So. At that point, select all the images that, uh, sorry, all the layers that are relevant, go down and duplicate them, mm -hmm. put a folder in them, make a folder of it. Uh, sorry, you should have done that first. Ignore me. Let's try this again. Select all your layers, put it in a folder, duplicate the folder, and then merge one of them. All of a sudden, you can hide this, and all of a sudden, all your stuff is on one layer, is flat, but you've saved all the old work as well. 
So at that point, you can progress forward with a smaller image that is more con contained, but you still have a fallback in terms of, shite, I just screwed up the entire image, what do I do? Well, guess what, you just saved everything. Mm -hmm. So work smart. At this point, like I said, everything has been merged. And so like now I can go in and use the smudge tool and go like, well, this is really rough. And let me try it. and let me try and blend this and work everything in again and make that a little bit smoother and so on and so forth. And like I said in the last session, the smudge tool is really, really a great tool. Uh, it takes a bit of time to get used to, but once you find a strange setting that you're comfortable with and uh, a workflow that you're comfortable with with the smudge tool is going to be one of your best friends in Photoshop. I kid you not. I love this tool. So let's go ahead and keep refining this guy. Yay. Do you have any suggestions as to a resource, uh, a single book or, a s or anything like that that it would be a good start off for digital painting? Anatomy books. Anatomy books. Straight off the bat. I know so many artists that are going into digital art and that have no sense of anatomy. You really cannot do yourself a disfavor. Learning Photoshop or any other painting program is pretty straightforward. You can just sit down in the evening and play with it. I find I'm very easily self-taught, so rather than sitting through tutorials and mindless and mindless talking and them going through things, I don't pick up a lot of that. I like better to just go through it and bu pretty much butchering the program by testing things and saying, this works, this doesn't, that's interesting. But when I see something that someone else does, sure, you teach yourself and you trick it, pick up whatever they put down, that kind of thing. But what I'm trying to say is that there is no real book or way to learn a software effectively. You're going to teach yourself it quicker, quicker than most on your own. Mm -hmm. But what you can't necessarily pick up as easily is anatomy, you know, uh, mm -hmm. drawing properly, learning things. So do yourself a favor and save your money from buying useless tutorials and whatnot, unless you absolutely, because there's so many free ones out there, especially now with Google mm -hmm. and <laughs> Internet and DeviantArt and everything else. Uh, instead, do yourself a favor and spend your money on a really good anatomy book and sit down with that and draw with that and learn from that because it's one thing you're never going to be good enough at. When it comes to books and resources like that, some of them, is this even on? Okay. Um, I look at them in different levels. There's general, we can say classical, or just general entry books that'll teach you anatomy, that'll teach you the basics of painting, that teach you the basics of whatever. And then they get more and more detailed, okay? That, now the intermediate and advanced uh, books or any sort of resources like that, they also tend to start getting more and more towards what this one artist or this teacher does. So they're narrow, they can be narrowing and they can also be advancing you, but you've got to be aware of that. When you grab a book that just is saying this is your, your one-stop digital painting, well, you very well may be getting a great tutorial on how this person uh, does their work and, and learn some new tricks, but look at it just as, as what it is. It's not the way to paint. It's, yep. you know, it's some tips and tricks and so on. Yeah. The more general ones are the, the basic foundational education of, of uh, basic design and, and um, uh, anatomy books are or what everybody needs. After that is kind of like the Wild West. Okay. If you want a specific one that I've got a lot of faith in and I like, um, there's an author named Glenn Siegmiller. All right, S-E-E-G Miller, one word, last name, Glenn Siegmiller. He does, uh, uh, I think the books are all called because he continues them as there are new versions of different software. He's a classical painter and all of his stuff is, going to be start out with uh, uh, character design and digital painting techniques um, but his stuff usually ends up being very almost high fantasy smooth illustrative stuff but you can the techniques are the same you can use them whatever way you want to but his stuff uh, I think it's uh, character design and digital painting are, are the, the terms for those books and he does them for painter and he also does them for Photoshop okay but again you're gonna see how Glenn Siegmiller does his finished stuff, but along the way he'll help you out with a, a lot of just entry level questions you might have about uh, using Photoshop or Painter. Okay. 
and he keeps them fairly consistent. I just love working with it and playing with it myself because yeah. I just pick up things easier, I guess. Mm -hmm. But eh, to each their own, to each their own. Well, you leave these behind. They're just good to sort of start you off with a, a few little ideas and some real <laughs> tangible stuff. Yes. All right, which then you can sort of jump off into your own way. So now that area is nice and smooth and I'm happy with it and I can now cr progress and detail it or, or progress and uh, continue coloring if I so want to. <laughs> oh, no, don't fall. Ah! We have people falling. That wasn't expensive. That would have been very expensive. Um, but yeah, if there are any specific things that you have always wondered about, like how to do it differently, or if you have any feedback or uh, questions regarding what we're currently working on, feel free. It doesn't even have to be related to what we're doing currently. Uh, if there's any answers, sorry, if there's any questions I can answer regarding a particular way of painting or um, coloring or a method that you've always been interested in, shoot. Um, this is all for you guys. I'm not here to just draw and goof around, which is well, this is what I feel like I'm doing. But do you <laughs> want to take questions on breaking into the business or yeah, just anything. general? Any, anything, anything to do with getting into... This is basically your opportunity to, you know, grill us for whatever information that you think might be useful for you. Um, so, how many of you guys are actually thinking about uh, pursuing career in concept, illustration, things like that? And, uh, hesitant That's arms, raise them, raise them. Sort them. of on. unsure. There you okay. go. <laughs> all right. First of all, um, concepting is a very rough business you are likely going to have a lot of competition, a lot, a lot of competition. Uh, every concept artist is different. Every artist is going to use a different amount of techniques and styles and so on and so forth. My greatest advice to you, find your own style. Find your own proficiency and draw what you love. Basically, don't tell yourself completely to someone else unless it's a company that you really love and you really have the same style that they're actually developing for. Mm -hmm. um, nine times out of ten, when you bring up a portfolio tailored to a company and uh, you have exactly what they want, well, they might pick up an interest in you. However, if a, a company is browsing for a contract worker, which is most often concept concepting, there's very few companies that actually keep concept artists in house unless they have knowledge in other areas as well that they can help out with because you're not going to sit around drawing all day. I'm sorry. It's just how it is. Concepting as a full-time position, unless you are a freelancer and you have a huge clientele and you can just punch out drawing after drawing, mm -hmm. you're gonna pick up something else as well that you need to be proficient mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Harsh reality. What are all the things you do at Tripwire? I do texturing, I do graphic design, I help out with the iconography, I do uh, all the advertisements, almost. Uh, mm -hmm. I also do, uh, as I said, assisting with texturing, concepting, turnarounds, basically from start to finish. Um, the list is long and it keeps getting longer, but <laughs> that makes me more valuable because for my company, it's a very small trip. Our interactive is not particularly big. We have about 30, 35 devs, 50 as a whole, if you take, out the Q, take in the QA department as well. As such, I have to wear many hats. Many people in our company also wear many hats. And the more you wear and the more efficient you can be with wearing, keeping those hats on oh my lords. Hang on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm not saying spread yourself thin and become good at uh, average in many different areas. Become rock solid in what you love to do because that's what you're gonna aim to do for the rest of your life. And then pick up things that are related to that area that you're also good in and excel mm -hmm. in those as well. Don't spread yourself too thin, though, because no one's going to be able to use you. Mm -hmm. They'll be like, well, we have someone that is awesome at this. You're kind of average at this. But if you're really good at something and then you get hired and they're like, well, can you help with this? Yeah, I can help with this. All of a sudden, your value increased because mm -hmm. you can pick up load from someone else that is overworked right now. Plus, for your own career, you're not, you might wake up one day and decide that whatever you're doing is a little 
boring or mundane or yeah, not for you. and just for your own satisfaction you want to again not have the jack of all trades syndrome but be flexible be strong yes. here and then interested in growing here and have some other things that maybe I can do it's not where my passion lies I can do you know basic web design yeah. I have no feeling whatsoever other than cashing the check. Exactly. <laughs> you know? And she also was talking about um, as a staff, to be a staff person, you've got to be able to fill a lot of different things because uh, you're not always just going to make your paycheck um, with, with the, the concept. But if you can do illustration, you can also do the graphic design of placing it in marketing or advertising. You can also get on and do a little bit of the web design, you know, illustration, web design, et cetera. Yep. And texturing, too. Yeah. Um, the, um, that sort of stuff, you, then you'll be kept around. You won't just be part of the staple of, of uh, contractors or freelancers. But even as a freelancer, I've mostly worked as a freelancer, I have to kind of be all over the place, from storyboards to comics to illustration to, uh, to concepting, yeah. toy and design, these sort of things. I personally got the heck away from freelancing, personally, because... Uh, I'm sure Tom can agree with this. Not all clients are great and easy to work with. So it really depends on are you a people person? Are you able to meet other people's demands? Are you able to be flexible and step away from your work and not be married to it, which I really encourage you. You need to become detached from your work. Because when people start critiquing it, you are a director, you're a client, and you can't take that critique, you might as well walk out the door. Mm -hmm. It's hard. I still have difficulties with it from time to time, but you really, really need to take a distance from what, what you're working on. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. gonna get shredded at some point. Mm -hmm. It's gonna get thrashed at some point. It's gonna be reworked at some point. Yeah, it's, you look at it as communications, challenges, solutions. That client, that boss, that coworker is not a social worker trying to make you feel good about your work, okay? Oh. Critique is not a group session. All right. It's about getting something done. You, again, that, that idea that you're a business person and art or whatever you're doing as art is your business. Okay? So you've got to get over that. That is a personal problem that you've got to deal yeah. with. And other professionals will help you. But don't make, and, and ultimately they won't be the ones to help you. Don't make your teammates and your boss deal with that because that will be problems for you. That is you not functioning well in a business with other people in a business endeavor. But that's a learning process, so don't take it to heart, but make sure that you are aware of it and that you will gradually work on it. And establishing a clientele as a freelancer is hard. You have to be out there. You have to be active. You have to be attractive in terms of like talking to them, communicating with them, and working with what they want. Because if you can't provide what they want, they're going to look for someone that will. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to... They may tell you what they like and they don't and you'll count that as a, as a critique but they're not going to sit there and, and help you grow. Your teachers will and although you might beat up the teachers and think like oh that person just says this and has nothing but you know these comments for me. Um, it stops you know when your, your diploma is handed to you. They actually are the people who are, who are, who are going to care about making you better and better and better. Mm -hmm. In the business world you got it, you're hired, you don't, you're out the door. Okay? Not in a nasty way. They'll, they'll probably say, oh, yeah, it's great, we'll call you. But that's the way they, they just move you along. Okay? Yeah. You've either got it or not. They're not going to necessarily make you better. When you're, you might be an investment in an asset, and of course now it's tooling you into what the production is, um, but they're not there in general just to caringly make you better. Those were your teachers um, or your mentors or the people who are helping you along the way. Yep. And when you get an honest critique from someone, take it to heart. It might be the most brutal thing you ever heard and you might not agree, at least consider it. Mm -hmm. There might be something in there that actually will make you a better artist. Mm -hmm. Please don't discard it immediately. It could be a really huge mm -hmm. mistake. I've had critiques or, or meetings and so on that, that I wasn't ready to understand what they're talking about. I understood it logically, I understood the English, the communication, but I really didn't take it to heart and know, oh, I mean, I remember it scared uh, walking away from um, art directors from like DC or whatever and like wow I don't think I was necessarily put out by them but I really didn't get what they're talking about or I thought like well okay that's nice you know I disagree and then later on years later or, or sooner I know exactly what they're talking about now sometimes you don't have the frame of reference because you're growing you're not there yet to to gauge what they're saying and they're trying to make you understand okay so all right you got a question sir Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the challenges and what are some of the things that aren't going to be able to see like challenges in some of the people that I didn't think that was really possible to see 
Oh, more and more it is. Well, basically, you have to remember that there's always going to be someone better than you. Always, always, always. There's always going to be someone cheaper than you. And so you got to make sure that you're attractive in terms of that, in that way. And like I said, establishing a clientele is hard. But when you have a client, treat them valuably. Try and work with them. Uh, it may be shit work. You might be drawing like middle, My Little Pony on an advertisement that is for something completely different. Mm -hmm. And you're like, eh, this doesn't look very great, but I have a paycheck. Cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you may not agree with their decisions, but ultimately in the beginning, until you can make a sex... Uh, sorry. Uh, until you can mm. sell your products as an individual and not be controlled completely with what the client wants, you're going to have to deal with a lot of shit. It's just how it is. If you want food on the table, you're going to have to deal with a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. And being in control of your stuff is, is going to happen probably never. And there's nothing wrong with that. You're a business person. You're, you're doing product. Okay? And you're bringing great expressive art and a great skill and a love of, of the art to it. But that's what you're ultimately doing. Um, yeah, so you be, should be a solutions person. I'm not saying you don't feel or want to say things, you feel them and keep them to yourself and don't say those things. <clears throat> and even when you have to uh, have maybe a run-in, you have a professional run-in. You explain, you talk, you suggest, and then you eventually come to a conclusion. And if you're not the say-so person, then somebody else is going to say so. And hopefully they're open and they're, you know, but they're also not picking uh, what they want out of personal reasons. It's for what, whatever's best for the production. Some other things, in fact, I was just talking to a, a, an art director in the other room. That's great about these things. Go find them. Okay. I'll tell you who he is later on if you want. But they're all over the place right now. And he was talking about having to go from staff to uh, a, whole, a whole staple of, of freelance contractors and feeling like he's a babysitter. And, and that you don't want to be one of those babies he's sitting. Great, talented people. He's, but nonetheless, the round of phone calls. He wants people who, who, who bring solutions and a willing mind to say, yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do that. What do you mean? If they don't know and, and ask some more questions to come to solution. But people who want to make it work. I want to make it work. I try to use that term as much as possible when I'm getting into a job. I want to make it work. Whatever makes it work. Okay? There are lines. I don't bring them up at the moment. But, you know, whatever makes it work is, is the type of person. You want to be a yes person and whatever makes it work. Now, um, here's the thing. That's then. the biggest thing with them, at least from their point of view. Yeah. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is a very harsh industry. Uh, you're going to take a lot of hits. And if you're not passionate about what you're doing, stop. <laughs> if you're not willing to sit and do a bunch of hours every day in order to get better at your craft, stop. Find something that will motivate you to spend those hours to being happy and doing something that you love. Like, seriously, because, as I said, there's always going to be someone better than you. There's always going to be someone cheaper than you. If you don't have a passion to put forth the effort and the time towards this career, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're going to hit a wall sooner than the client is going to tell you that there's a wall. Basically, you need to have the motivation and drive in order to get better at this and get a career out of this. No one ever graduates with their student portfolio and hands over their student portfolio to an interview and they go hired. That doesn't happen. These day and age, what we want to see is you doing your student portfolio and then that you go home and do that 10 times over in a better way that is your way. That's something that you like to do. Something that visibly shows that you gave a shit about the thing that you just produced. Sorry, I'm very harsh in my words. <laughs> I, I curse a lot and I apologize. Now, when you deliver that portfolio to that person instead, chances are they're going to see that that is your original work and they're going to be like, wow, this is cool. And chances are if you tailor your portfolio to a company that reflects your passion and what you like to do, you might just get hired. And if you don't get hired, but you get critiqued, take that critique to heart, go home, work your butt off, come back again, and show them that I just got better. Hey, I, did, I took your advice. Do you like it? What can I do to get better? Mm -hmm. They will see your passion. They will see how hard you worked. Mm -hmm. And they will likely reward you for it one way or another. 
But if you're not passionate about what you're doing, if you're not willing to go home and work your butt off once you've done your classes at university or wherever there is you're going and improve your portfolio, mm -hmm. sorry. Might as well head on down to Walmart and get a part-time job. And they have no idea when they see... <laughs> but, what I, but you get what I mean. It's yeah. like mm -hmm. if you don't have the, uh, the willingness to actually work and get, work your butt off and become better than the person next door, that you're looking at all their artwork and go like, oh, I want to be like that one day. You're not going to get there. And when they look at your Sorry, work, it could be the best stuff in the world just to look at. There it is done. They have no idea what process you've gone through, how long it's taken, how many times you've turned over, which is great, or whether you just blah, put it out in the paper and this looks good. Um, later on, you're net networking, just like uh, Louis said. Um, that's what you can use a blog for. Hey, I met you. I'm following through. By the way, that's also communication. They're realizing they can work with you when you talk to them and, and shake their hand and, and, and smile at them and, and look them in the eye. Um, so they're learning a lot about you, of how they can work with you, which is very, very important above and beyond just your ability to do great art or not. But then when you follow through and a week later they see you've got another piece, maybe even that's reacting to the criticism they said or what they want, or maybe they said something minor like, this is all wonderful stuff, but we don't do this yeah. thing right now. And then you go and produce a piece that's a little more like it, and they can say, yeah, one in their head, they're going, hey, second contact of a sale, by the way. <laughs> Okay, it's yeah. a second contact you're making network-wise. And they say, all right, and they may even be flattered. Wow. And I won't say it's rare, but it is gratifying to see when somebody follows through on, on the time and effort and critique you've given them. All right. And then, but they also see this person works. This, this person just didn't, over two quarters, produce four things that were good to okay to even great. But it's still two quarters, all right, because you're pl ultimately applying for something that's a day-to-day -day job. Yep. or a week-to-week -week contract, whatever it might be. Um, so they're learning some, some things about being able to work with you. And then two weeks later, they get another one. By the way, now you're creating a, a third contact, and you're, uh, you're also having a professional relationship with this person. Okay? And they're all the more going to contact you back, possibly. <laughs> okay? Especially out of many people you, you treat like this. And they're going to see, all right, they did something in two weeks. They contacted me. They can speak. They can write. They can communicate. All right, and I'm going to communicate back to them. And then two weeks later, another thing, and another thing, and another thing. That's what your blog's there for, attached to your website or whatever it might be. And, and that's going to win them over, too. Not just this one blow them away piece. And then you never contact them again. Okay, so. And then it's game over. No, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it's just a trickle effect, little by little by little. And then they go, eh, I think I'm going to finally pull the trigger on this guy and give him a job, give her a job, see what they can do. And they'll call up and they'll be like, hey, are you finally ready to do something for us? Mm. You'll get those phone calls. I got those phone calls. You'll get those phone calls. And they, they're proofing you through that. And a lot of it wasn't just, boom, look at this great stuff that my mom loves and all my kids and my fr professors love, too. You know, I'm not, but there needs to be s stuff above and beyond that. Um, in contrary to what Luis said about people just getting hired right out of the box, I've seen that. It's and I've great. seen horror stories from it because they weren't ready because they didn't have that larger professional attitude and they burnt out quick or maybe they ran with the big boys for a while but they it was too quick <laughs> all right so um, it's also dangerous suddenly to do your first comic book up first and then get a contract to do spider-man mm. that's I've seen that a lot in comics and it, it's dangerous on the other side too but either way you eventually have to become that business person and take care of all those things that most of you want to say, I don't want to deal with that, I just want to draw. Well, guess what? You're never going to get to the point of consistently, or maybe at all, you'll get frustrated and just quit, period, um, of doing it daily, um, unless you take care of all those things that you don't want to do. Know those professional interplay communication things. Know those contracts. Know all those things. Because those will trip you up quicker and keep you from doing what you just want to do. You need to know those things. Your taxes, all that sort of stuff at least have a broad understanding of them, or else those would be the quickest things to kick you out. Who had a question over there? Miss? Um, so you're saying, um, uh, like, people want to know that, you know, you've got passion to do at home, it's not just if you study, you know, if you care about it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but, like, when I'm, when I'm making, when, when I'm producing something that someone has paid me for, or uh, um, I'm going to get paid for, mm -hmm. it's, the same, it doesn't feel the same way as when, you know, I'm just drawing for fun. It 
when I'm going for flights, I take my time. There's like a lot of tinkering, and you know, I go in and I'm spending a lot of time on the parts that like I really, really care about. And when I, you know, and I really like doing that, and I kind of, it, it, it kind of feels really like hard sometimes to transfer, mm -hmm. you know, like. Mm -hmm what it is I like doing and all the things that I know that mm -hmm. I'm good at into what people are, you know, asking me to do all these different types of things. And um, basically, one of, the, one of the biggest problems is, like, how do, you, how do you keep track of your own personal, like, style limitations when transferring them uh, to, you know, lots of different forms and, and medias and things that you're being asked to do? And one personal thing is that, um, like, uh, I read Throng Details, too, like, mm -hmm. I channel panel panel. You're all right. Uh, <laughs> firstly, I guess to summarize is that how do you keep the passion for the boring jobs? In a way, and also how to limit yourself when you're spending a lot of time on drawing, but you necessarily don't have that time. All right. So first off, you're going to get a lot of boring jobs in the bro in the beginning before you have a name for yourself or anything else, especially in freelance. You're going to have to do the odd jobs that are really boring. You're going to have to do the logo or the sticker or the mascot for the company that looks absolutely horrific. And you're like, why on earth are you having a winged raccoon as your mascot? Mm -hmm. Or something, whatever it may be. Like, when it comes to those jobs, think of it this way. The product that you're delivering to them is a, representing a, a res representation of your talent. Even if you don't agree with what you're actually doing for them, make sure it looks as good as you can possibly get it because it's actually a, one of your faces. Other people that are coming around and looking at your work, even if it's not the work that you want to do, they're going to look at it and go like, how, look, how good is that? Would I want to have that? Even if they may not agree with the portrait, at least you executed it professionally. If you don't like the concept, sure, tough luck, but it's bread on the table. You have to feed yourself and you have to make the client happy and you're building up a reputation. Don't do a shit job just because you don't like it. Do as good a job as you can because it res it's a representation of how good you could do it. It sounds very rudimentary, yeah. but it's so true though. Yeah, so, so, so the actual prompt, the actual thing you're doing may not be something that's uh, of your choice. By the way, you can always say no. Yeah, but right. but when you take it, then you're doing their job. Um, but you should find then you can find your love and your passion in in the process mm -hmm. and and in the excellence of of the execution. Okay. So I guess in short, don't lose sight of that, and uh, see it as a piece of your portfolio. You may not agree with what you're doing, but make it as best as you can because eventually, those crappier jobs are going to disappear because you're going to get hired for better things. They're going to look at those mm -hmm. things. And you'll have more opportunities to yeah. pick things that you like more. Exactly. Make sure that you're proud of everything that you have in your portfolio. You know, because this is your portfolio. Okay. You may not like the raccoon, but it's your portfolio. Make it a good raccoon. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Okay. Yeah, art, art is another thing that men do. Okay? It's not magic. Yeah. All right. It is not uh, 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 some flow that takes you above the, the humdrum uh, things of mankind and, and makes you more of a god. <laughs> it's just a series of techniques and things you want to do or don't and things you fulfill or, or, or ways of, 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 of solving certain problems to create something. And yes, you want a passion for it, just like you're saying, you know, get out of art and get into plumbing if or passion is, is for plumbing or, 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 or law or whatever. Have a passion for whatever you're doing. That's the best thing. I would say that's sort of magic, but even that's just a matter of, of, of focus. Um, yep. Try to just be, become more business-like, and if you don't like a project, don't do it. Okay? Um, ultimately, if you're serving a client, you're serving a client. And hopefully, ultimately, they've picked the right person, too. I've had those comments or those moments where, like, you already picked me. You saw 100 pieces of my work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we already went through this. Now you want something different. Um, that can be a little abrasive. Yeah. But hopefully, they've also made a good choice, and you've made a good choice. So make good choices when it comes to that sort of stuff. All right? You shouldn't be looking at something saying, oh, this is crap. It's below me and that sort of stuff. Don't oh. take it if it is. You can make those choices before you take the job. This is why you have a part-time job. If you don't necessarily love that particular client, try and find someone else. But cut it professionally. If mm -hmm. you don't like the person, mm -hmm. don't be an ass. Mm -hmm.
Just try and be professional because what goes Grit around comes around. And the quicker you get away from those situations if it is a bad situation. Okay. Mm. And here's another thing too, it happens with a lot of students. Um, they don't have to care about your feelings. You, your wife, your husband, your, your, your mother, your father, your brother. Those people who are more personal can care about your feelings. Even your pride. All right. Is it good or is it not? Does it serve the job or not? Okay, that's what matters. Okay, um, somebody says I'm proud of this. I'll hear it. I'll look at the and see if it's good or not. That's all I care. I just heard words. I heard breath coming out of their mouth. Is the project, the product that they're, I'm looking at when they show me their project, good or not? Yeah. That's what matters. So, keep your feelings and your emotion and your ego in check because you're a business person. All right. Otherwise, you can't go more fine arts oriented and. and play those games uh, for the rest of your life and and that's fine that that is a choice open to you but Keep, ultimately yeah sorry go, go ahead on. oh please uh, I'm just rambling now <laughs> above all like with, with the point of ego i know i stressed about this in last session as well and i'll stress it again ego is the first thing that's going to ruin you as an artist don't have one it's okay to look at your piece and go like i like this piece i'm i'm happy with this piece this is actually nice that's fine but the moment your ego goes up and it goes into such a degree that, you know, you start becoming full of yourself saying, I'm better than that person. I'm better than this. I don't need you. As soon as you get an attitude like that, before you realize it, you just limited yourself. You mm -hmm. will not continue to evolve and become a better artist because your ego's in the way. I've seen so many artists that have great potential that are stuck in a rut because they're so full of themselves. They have the whole deviant art thing. It's like, I do <laughs> fan art and I have the best fan art of this. I have 100 million followers. I am God. And ask them to draw something else. They can't draw it to save their life. And that's because they limited themselves. Mm -hmm. Egos are destructive. They're really destructive. Get over yourself. It's okay to like your work. But don't get attitude over it. The moment you see artists that have an attitude, you just got ugly. You mm. really got ugly. And you start seeing the artists that less. And, and there are um, illustration, comics. It's more about style and it's more about you and it's more about... It, it is almost kind of fine art-ish, um, which is perfectly fine. You can choose those things. This, uh, I would say, concept is, is moves very much towards a, a diverse mm. use of your skills and a lot of different things you might be doing. So. You end up doing a, a lot of different things. And again, you can limit them yourselves and also turn down jobs and all those sort of things yeah. along the way. Anyways, egos are ugly. Skip them. Go okay. away. Remove them. Or you can choose a path where it's very much, exactly, it's, it's about you and the personality and that sort of stuff. Very much more entertainment yeah. based. I don't like okay. egos. Mm -mm. Okay. All right. no. But we have, oh, go on, miss? For a concept art portfolio, um, show your only your best, best work. Do not put in a sketch that you're kind of like, eh. Don't, don't do that. If it's only three, four pieces in your portfolio because of that, that's fine. Just put for your best foot forward and show your thought process as well. So if you're doing concepting, show good silhouettes, show good sketch work, show the pipeline from this is how it started, this is how it ended. So that way they can see how quick you were, how efficient you were, how through you were with a concept before the final thing is that they're looking at. Okay. That's really valuable. Yeah. So show you from beginning to end of working up a project? Yeah. It okay, doesn't yeah. hurt. It yeah. really doesn't. Just like you showed us here. Yeah. Show solid time. stuff though. You know, but we like rough sketches. We really do. A lot of, the, okay, mm -hmm. like I said in the very beginning of the first session is that the finely Fancy, fancy concept art pieces that you see from Blizzard or from uh, 2K Games or anything like that, that is like this beautiful big piece. It's presentation level. Presentation level is pimp shots. That's the shots that basically they pick the concept that was really rough and go like, okay, polish that thing. We need that for PR purposes. Mm -hmm. That's rare. It's really cool that you have them in your portfolio because it shows how much polish and how good you can do. But ideally, they want to look at your thumbnail work they want to see your thought process they want to see your silhouettes they want to see your work through and through up until that pretty piece mm -hmm. because you'll be doing more of that than you'll be doing pimp shots 
because you need you basically need to show your modeler, your rigger, your art director, your thought process, and give mm -hmm. them what they want, which is going to be rough stuff more than pretty stuff. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're the communicator. They have ideas. You're the creator. That means a lot of rough works. Excellent. But they need to be good. good. The session is almost over. Sorry. I guess um, you can uh, show us the, uh, the final product or where you are, where it might still need to go and wind up the piece of art. Sure. Or we can, have, uh, or we yeah, can take a last few questions. It's, uh, it's up to you. All right. Well, he's waving at y'all. <laughs> so we did some shading. We did some coloring, showed some basic techniques. This is far from finished, obviously, because we've been talking more than we've been doing. <laughs> yeah. But I hope that the little we actually managed to show you on the technical side were helpful. But above all, I really encourage you guys to just get some confidence, go home, draw, develop your style, become comfortable with your own skin and what you can develop, and get those portfolios really shining. And please, for the love of God, what? do not bring phones to show your portfolios. Yesterday, I had the horrific experience of seeing people walking up with phones. That's insulting, not just to me, but above all to your works. Mm -hmm. Don't come anywhere near a portfolio review with a phone. Bring a proper portfolio, print out your works if you have to go the old-fashioned way, who cares? Or a proper tablet or a laptop. Have it prepared. Don't come up and start opening up folders and like, ah, a moment. Mm -hmm. Have it prepared. Make a proper presentation, PowerPoint, whatever. An easy way for we to, us to go through the work and look at your stuff in the best way possible. Nothing turns, us off, turns me off personally off more than having you come up with a shitty portfolio <laughs> on a tiny screen or crooked papers or haven't prepared it for you. Give me five minutes while I pull up the mm -hmm. folder. That just shows that you're not professional. You're not serious. You don't want this job. That is the first thing that comes into my head when I see this. I'm not alone with this. Mm -hmm. Take time. Show your stuff some respect. Show yourself for some respect. Come dressed up, not as in a t-shirt and some well, shaggy like shorts. I mean, shaggy. that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. This is Siege. But <laughs> for an interview, for any kind of portfolio yeah. review, Come up with something nice, a button-up shirt, a nice pair of pants. I'm not talking suit. You don't have to come up in the suit. Just nice dress, nice short, ni nice shorts, nice okay. pants. Something that represents All that you would wear to work. Okay. You know. Yeah, and, and they might be in cutoffs and, and crappy shirts and everything, but you're not them yet. You're trying not to impress yet. them. Okay? <laughs> when, when you get hired, I'd still wait a little while. I used to wear a shirt and tie all the time to school, and I don't anymore. But <laughs> show, show that you know that you can be professional. Yeah, show and again, all those little things that, again, I, don't wanna, I only want to draw. I don't want to do this. Take care of all those. Mm -hmm. So guess what? You'll get a job, and you'll only draw after that. Yeah. All right. Otherwise, you'll sabotage yourself. But please, don't bring me or anyone else a phone. No phones. Don't bring a crappy, like, crumpled up portfolio with coffee stains and stuff. It's, come on. You got that last, yesterday? I got some stuff like that yesterday. Okay. It was a little sad. I don't feel sad for, like, the reviewers. I feel sad for the people that just come, came up with it because they don't even have their foot through the door even with that well, stuff. Some of those things are so basic that you say to yourself, if I have to say it, I shouldn't bother saying it. You know, just take care of those simple things. And, and then, then it gets to be all about your art once you've taken care of those simple things that at least I think are logical. All right. So instead, so, we have a happy man dancing. Happy all right, dancing. so. And, you know, Luis or, or, my, or, or I will, would love to talk to you more. We've got the rest of the weekend. There are tons of other professionals. Find those art directors, too. I mean, we're just talking about our, our, our uh, interplay with art directors and so on. Uh, but talk to them, and they'll be more than willing to tell you what they want. Every, yep. The more they, the, you know what they want, the more they're going to uh, not waste time and not waste your time or their time. So they're out there. Go find them. Just look at their tag. It'll tell you. Okay. There's a Cartoon Network guy out there. There's business owners. Go and find them. Talk to them. Uh, okay. Last but not least, if you feel that you're not confident in a particular part of your field, like, for instance, you do characters all the time, but you never paint environments. Paint environments. Don't shackle yourself to one thing and specialize yourself to one thing only. That's do a good idea. Do stuff that is uncomfortable in terms of art 
like drawing and whatnot. Break free from the norm and do something different. The more you do that, the better an artist you're going to become automatically. Yeah, you might just like doing characters, but you may never ever get to the position or work your way into just doing characters unless you have a broad a diversity, a variety of things. Not something you hate to do, don't do that. Um, but, you know, be able to do characters and backgrounds and props and vehicles. Yep. Okay. Also, last but not least, I forgot that last time. We have a pretty little sheet up here. If you it? want to do testing. This is blind testing, focus testing for Tripwire games. If you're interested in helping us out with this, I'm shameless marketing here. <laughs> <laughs> Come up, write your name and your email, and you'll get to test some stuff for us. So, Come on, help me. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot for listening to us. And, and like I said, if you have any questions or need a card, come on up here and you can get one from Luis or, or myself no. at any time during the rest of the weekend. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.